thank you all very much for inviting me back. I'm running out of things to say. <laughs> you guys are great. I hope I'm as good as the dessert. <laughs> I want to talk tonight about science and how science uh, in interfaces with faith. I am a card-carrying, hardcore scientist, so that's the perspective I'm coming from. And in particular, I'm a physicist, so what I have to say may not pertain to all branches of science. And when I get to the faith part, I'm going to rely on my two esteemed colleagues over here to fill in the blanks. So let's talk, uh, this is the topics I want to cover. I want to spend a few minutes talking about what science really is, because I think it's not always understood by the public, and what are the strengths and weaknesses of this field, and some instances in which science and faith can meet, and what I'm stressing is the common ground between the two. And uh, lastly, I'll indicate why I believe that science and faith are compatible. And if we have time, and if, you, uh, if you're interested, we can talk about the, uh, my critique of Stephen Hawking's newest book, in which he concludes that God is unnecessary. You notice the word critique. OK, so let's talk about what science is. Well, simply, it's the search for understanding nature. And science proceeds uh, in two parts. Firstly, by recording observations, and secondly, by creating mental models to explain what these observations mean. And I hesitate to use the word theory because that word has been used and abused by both scientists and the general public, and no one really knows what that word means anymore, so I'm going to call it a mental model. Now, the observations, when they're confirmed by multiple groups around the world, tend to be among the most extraordinarily reliable facts that humans have available to them. Rarely, if ever, is an actual observation uh, overturned by new work. The models, on the other hand, are interpretations of these observations, interpretations of the data, and these interpretations do evolve over time particularly as new and more precise data become available. So, unlike mathematics, scientists never prove any of our models. We never prove them in the same sense as mathematicians prove their theorems. So 25 centuries ago, uh, Euclidean geometers proved that the sum of the three angles of any triangle always add up to 180 degrees. That only had to be proven once. It's true for all eternity, and it's an absolute fact. But it deals only with idealized triangles in an idealized geometry, and no mathematician could prove that that theorem has anything to do with the real world. To prove that that theorem has something to do with real triangles would require a scientist to go out and make measurements. And since our measurements have limited precision, all we could ever say is these triangles are either close or not close to having 180 degrees. And in fact, no triangle drawn on the surface of the Earth will have 180 degrees because the surface of the Earth is curved. Now these models are not proven, but what scientists attempt to do is to validate these models as being effective and we define a specific range of situations in which the model is effective and a specific uh, limit of precision to which that model works. So let me give you an example. Newton's laws of gravity and motion are effective throughout our solar system for any object moving less than a million miles an hour to a precision of five digits. And that's pretty darn good. You could design a bridge or an airplane or launch a rocket to Mars, and it would all work Newton, using Newton's laws. But if you try to measure the orbit of Mercury to seven digits, or deal with things that are moving faster than a million miles an hour, or stars much more massive than our sun, then Einstein's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Newton's <laughs> equations are no longer precise enough. They simply don't match what nature does in those extreme situations. And for those, we need the more profound understanding and higher precision of Einstein's theories. So Newton wasn't exactly wrong, but his interpretation of the data has limited applicability. Okay, let's talk about how good some of these theories are. 
I'm going to talk about two of the uh, most hallowed uh, achievements of 20th century science. Quantum mechanics predicts a certain value for a certain property of the electron. It's not really important what that is. And it turns out that that matches experiment to 12 decimal digits, one part in a trillion. For the human mind to actually match nature to one part in a trillion, I think, is an just an outstanding achievement. And Einstein's theory of special relativity, in which Einstein assumed that the speed of light for empty space was constant in all directions, that has been confirmed to 18 decimal digits, one part in a million trillion. And I, uh, to say that these concepts of science are merely theories is, I think, to vastly underestimate the power. Now, how do these theories come to be accepted, these models, and how do the uh, observations come to be validated? Well, science is a bit strange in that regard. We don't have a hierarchy. There is no supreme authority, no pope, no supreme court, no congress that passes scientific laws. Even the most hallowed scientist and revered scientist in history, Albert Einstein, was demonstrably wrong half the time. Now, batting 500 is an outstanding accomplishment for a theoretical physicist or for a major league baseball player, but it's not good enough to be the person who decides on truth. So we don't relegate that decision to any individual. And science is also not a democracy. There is only one vote that gets to be cast, and that's the vote of nature. There are lots of things in science that no one likes, but that's the way nature is, so we simply have to accept it. It's nature that decides the scientific truth. I think it's also perceived by a lot of people that scientists are in collusion to uh, support each other and validate each other's crazy ideas, and actually that's, uh, it would be nice if scientists were that friendly. They're, they're typically not. It's a very uh, competitive business. There are a very limited number of senior professorships at the major universities. And the way that you get one of these is proving that all of your colleagues are wrong. <laughs> they are slightly less friendly with each other than the Democrats and the Republicans. OK, so what are the strengths and weaknesses of this system? Well, among the strengths are science is an intellectual gratification, as are art and music, but it is also society's greatest engine for improving our lives. Economists estimate that over the last century, 75% of the increased national wealth of our country has come from advances in science and technology. Science is humanity's best approach to addressing questions that I will describe as those that have numbers as their answers. So if you want to know the distance to the sun, the age of the earth, the age of the universe, I would turn to science. On the other hand, there are a vast number of very important questions. Oh, sorry, there is an example first. This is a supernova, uh, which was first observed in 1987. The supernova occurred at the center, and like all massive stars that are coming to the end of their lives, this star cast off its outer layers and then subsequently exploded and became brighter than about 100 billion other stars at the time of the explosion. And what we saw that was particularly unique in this case is that this inner ring of gas around the star lit up like a Christmas tree 245 days after the initial explosion was observed. So what does this tell us? We can imagine a triangle here. The uh, ring of gas around the star is this yellow uh, circle. The exploding star is at the center. And because it took 245 days for the light of the explosion to reach the gas, we know the height of that side of the triangle. It's 245 light days. We can also measure the angle with great <coughs> precision in our telescopes. And therefore, we know the length of this side of the triangle by simple geometry. This is 168,000 light years. So the angle is simply the ratio of these two sides. And this is perhaps the simplest demonstration in science that the universe is more than 6,000 years old. 
because if it took light 168,000 years to reach Earth from that explosion, then the Earth of the universe has to be at least that. Okay, but there are these uh, many compelling questions to which science is more or less useless. Uh, why was the Earth the universe created? Science has absolutely no idea. What is the purpose of human life? What are the principles that a righteous person should live by? And does, in fact, God exist? These are all questions that are beyond the ability of science to answer. And if God does exist, which of the many <coughs> visions of God that different people have is the one that's correct? Or are they all right or all wrong? Science simply can't answer any of these questions. Now I'm going to talk about three instances in which science and faith uh, seem to come together and discuss how we can find the common ground between them. Uh, this is